So this morning, uh, I was reflecting on a tough week. Um, actually, let me go back to the top slide here. It was a tough week because, uh, as, as usual, um, you know, the unpredictability makes it hard to create a stable learning environment. So I think the faculty members to, of today have to be flexible and have to be armed with lots of resources and create learning plans that are flexible. So I hope to be able to share that with you and give you some insight into how this is my baby app, meaning this is the app we started with seven years ago and it took a year to build one single body region. It's very involved, but it also was meant to serve much more than just a video library. The purpose of it was really to create scaffolding organization for the learner. So um, I'm excited to share that with you today. So when you think about, um, when, when we thought about these apps, we thought about a few key questions. One, how can I enhance motor learning for these early skills, for these different manual therapies, special tests, uh, exercises? So how can I enhance that? Because the traditional model is, I'm going to show you some techniques when you come to class, and then you're going to try to take notes, take videos, and hope that you caught it and go practice. I think today, when you have a very stable set of videos that you can access anytime, you can actually preload their brains with the techniques. So that's one of the things that I would highly suggest that we've been using. And I'll show you what I mean by that when I show you how our labs went yesterday. Um, uh, students should be able to prime their brains with your lab handouts watching videos on their own so that when they come to class, it's not the first exposure. They already know what's coming. I think that's big for motor learning. How can I develop clinical pattern recognition for common musculoskeletal conditions? Um, you know, ortho for me, when I started 20 years ago, there was a lot of conditions. I covered too many conditions. Today, I'm much more, I tie myself much more closely to the guidelines. So for shoulder pain, there's going to be three main conditions, the stuck shoulder, mobility deficits, the unstable shoulder, movement coordination impairments, and then the, the muscle power deficit, the impingement slash rotator cuff tendinopathy. The, the framework of talking about shoulder, which is what I'm talking about this week, is built around those primary conditions because then I can allude to other less common conditions, but there's great clarity and there's consistency in the concept of evaluation and treatment between body regions when I talk about mobility deficits. So I'll, I'll describe that in a little bit more detail, but we have carefully trimmed down many of the conditions that we talk about. You'll see that I talk about more than just those three conditions, but those are the pillars. Those are the clarity of the musculoskeletal conditions. So when I talk about back pain, you'll see that I covered the main guideline-based back pain conditions, that's it. If they can get good at doing, at seeing those five patterns or so, you've done a great justice to the patient population that they're very focused on guideline-based patterns. Um, so that's another thing that I think in terms of scaffolding, when you create clarity of the conditions that the guidelines tells us to practice like, the students can handle the volume because there's a way to organize the content. The other thing was, how do I ensure this clinical practice guideline implementation? How do I ensure implementation in my classroom? The apps follow the guidelines pretty much completely. And then we've added extra stuff on top of the guidelines that we think are at least centrist, relatively middle of the road techniques that we often teach and we often use in the clinic. And then lastly, how can I enhance application and development of clinical reasoning? I really wanna spend some time showing you what the SIMs are and how they will change the game for you. They're changing the game for us uh, because they're asynchronous, but they're very carefully planned. They're very, they take a long time to build. There's a lot of vetting. James is part of the vetting team. Um, James is a veteran professor in orthopedics for over 25 years. So let me move on to just show you a quick glimpse. This was, class on, uh, this was class on Tuesday. And I'm just gonna tease out a few, a few things of what I do every week. Oops, let me move back. So at the beginning of class, they have already watched my pre-lectures about basic shoulder 
shoulder range of motion, kinesiology, some review of basic pathology. And so I ask them at the beginning of class, before I just start lecturing, I say, what do you remember and what have you seen in the clinic that are the common conditions of the shoulder? So I let them speak. And what you'll see is right, I just so open a blank got, slide. Let's start with frozen shoulder, okay? Actually, no, let's start with, sh let's start with shoulder impingement. So the students are chatting in. And I'm going to connect impingement to, it looks like you guys have put rotator cuff tears, bicipital tendonitis. So they are chatting in all of these conditions that they've been exploring in the app. They've been thinking back to their previous experiences. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating the scaffold. So I'm taking from the chat and whatever they're saying to me in the class, here are these different conditions and I'm organizing them so that I can link them to the ICF category. Because in the very beginning of ortho, I have established what each of these common ICF categories mean, what they mean in terms of examination procedures, the general idea, and then what they mean in terms of rehab concepts, general rehab concepts. So for example, when we talk about uh, muscle power problems, tendon problems, overuse, tendonitis, tendinosis, they know that the examination strategy is typically some type of provocation to the tendon, stretching, uh, resisting it, palpating it, looking for thickening or looking for, and then they also know that some type of resisted test is useful for looking at muscle power and looking, trying to determine the level of involvement of the tendon. And then they know, oh, okay, so Dr. Wong always talks about EDU rep, educate the patient to rest, unload that tissue, eventually reload the tissue, and then prevent reoccurrence. That term is fixed in their mind because every time we talk about an Achilles tendinopathy or a lateral epicondylalgia or patellar tendinopathy, they have in mind that that is a muscle power deficit. I know how generally to examine it. And I also understand the basic rehab strategies. Once they have that picture, I revisit it every body region. And they already have this framework in which all my examination, all my techniques for manual therapy, all my therapeutic exercises fall within that kind of framework. So that's what you see happening here is we're just having an engagement. I think that's really valuable. So the students know that the moment I start class, I'm interested in what they have to offer. Okay, so there's something simple like this it has nothing to do with apps. It's really just my philosophy of how to engage the students and really make valuable what they have been studying on their own time. Because before they've come to class, they've already played through the apps because I have worksheets. The worksheets walk them through link by link all the common conditions for the shoulder region. So we're having this nice conversation. We're organizing the ICF category. And then eventually, I'll take you over to here, we talk a little bit about, so I, I spend uh, the first day talking about conditions and then walking through them through the app. So using the app as a way to map out the examination strategy, the treatment strategies, you'll be surprised how many things are, how much synthesis is occurring even before you create the chaos of teaching them all the techniques. I think this is, one of the biggest things that's really helped our program is that before they've even come into lab to learn the skills, they have watched the techniques on the lab handout once, they have walked themselves through the app once on their own with the worksheets, which I'll show you. And when I'm in class, I use the app with them and I create a narrative. I allow my clinical reasoning to become apparent. So we're talking about shoulder impingement, we walk our way into the app. We look a little bit at the prevalence data. And then, for example, uh, subacromial pain syndrome. In the then we look at the patient. We look at it together. Pain with muscle power deficits or shoulder impingement, subacromial pain syndrome, or rotator cuff tendinopathy. The patient will often complain of subacromial pinching pain, a sharp pain in the subacromial region an arc of pain, but full range of motion, and movements that decrease the space in the subacromial region 
reproduce the patient's sharp pinching complaint. So we talk a little bit about that. We end up going in and looking at the examination strategy. So I'm clicking through. This is stuff they've already walked through on their own. This is just my chance. This is just my chance at creating the narrative, allowing the clinician specialist to actually paint the picture. So we go through and we talk about, okay, here in the physical exam, if one of your hypothesis is there's shoulder impingement, then here is a cluster of tests that we're going to learn tomorrow. So I teach on Tuesday and Wednesday and Friday. So tomorrow we're going to go through some of these techniques. Imagine in their mind, though, that I've already created the pattern of shoulder pain, subacromial pain syndrome, uh, and I've already created these groupings. Here's an impingement cluster. Here is a rotator cuff, rotator cuff uh, tears. If you believe that the patient has significant tears, here's a cluster of tests that you guys have already talked about. Oftentimes, we'll just ask them, hey, you guys watch these videos. Could you chat in for me? What are some of the tests we're going to use for rotator cuff? So I'm drawing things out. I'm, it's, a, it's a form of graded exposure. And then when we go in and we look at these techniques, lots of times, actually, I'll show you in the next slide, we talk about some of the, the, the likelihood ratios, the specificity, and all of this is built upon some of the early work that they've done to create the patterns on their own. Um, I'm going to take you into the app just for a second to show you what I mean by what I'm doing. Uh, James, are there any things that any things in the chat that I should address before I go into the app? Yeah, the, the question was, are you going to share the pre-work worksheets? And I wrote that. Yes. Oh, yes, I think you're going Absolutely. to get there. Yeah. Yeah, there's not there's very little. Uh, there's nothing that you don't share, Mike. You go. Yeah. We're all in the same boat, guys. Let's help each other, help each other. Right. Yeah, so. so actually, let me show you that real quick. When you log in as faculty, there is a sidebar that has a few different tools that are really useful. Here, if you go to the complementary resources, you will see that it takes you to our website, the educator resource. Here under teaching content, you'll see these clinical pattern recognition worksheets. The students do these for very low credit. They turn them into me. I don't ask them to spend a ton of time, but I want them to walk through, add some notes. I will. I tell them that the more exposure you get before you come to class, the less overwhelming and the more open your mind is to receiving information. So if you go to shoulder, for example, you'll see that here are the main conditions. So when they look through adhesive capsulitis page, they will be asked, view the clinical findings video and answer a few questions. What did you notice about the key signs and symptoms? So that would be things like when you click on the link, you'll see here is a description. Let's see if it loads up here. Yep. Here is a description of frozen shoulder and its phases. Shoulder pain with mobility deficits or adhesive capsulitis. Stage one, which may last up to three months. Patients typically describe sharp pain at end range of motions, achy pain at rest and sleep disturbances. Note that even though the range is painful, she has full range of motion. An intact rotator cuff on testing of the muscles and early loss of external rotation range of motion is a hallmark sign at this stage. In stage two, the painful or freezing stage, the patients present with gradual worsening of motion in all directions due to pain, and this can last from three to nine months. The third stage, the frozen phase is characterized by pain and loss of motion that can last from nine to 15 months. Note the significant loss of hand behind back motion. The patient may report functional limitations of significant difficulty trying to wipe after using the restroom or donning and doffing their bra. In stage four or the thawing phase, the patient reports pain resolution, but persistent significant stiffness. Patients are at an increased risk for developing adhesive capsulitis if they have a history of diabetes mellitus and thyroid disease. And it is more common in females between the ages of 40 to 65 years of age who have had a previous episode of adhesive capsulitis in the contralateral arm. That allowed me to talk about a lot of different things when we talk about examination and interventions because the phases 
and how the patient presents differently is all laid out. It's already scaffolded in their mind. So that when they keep going through the worksheet, they will watch videos, clinical reasoning videos about the physical exam. So it's, it basically suggests what are the common things that are done. It talks about movement faults, common associated impairments. It talks about general intervention strategies. So when they watch these little interventions videos, these basically, when they go in here, they get to watch one, the clinical reasoning of the management. They also basically can go back and explore in the intervention. So if I go back to shoulder here, all diagnoses, adhesive capsulitis, you can see that there's a clinical reasoning video. That's what they just watched. And I invite them to explore. What kind of things would you do for frozen shoulder? Well, it kind of depends. Are they in the highly irritable phase where I would do gentle things like grade one, two mobs or oscillations? Or are they in a later phase where I can be mobbing more aggressively or using a lot of active, repeated active range of motion, right? Low to high repetition, passive range of motion. I'll also ask them, hey, so this is in class. What kind of exercises do you tend to see when the patient is in the highly irritable phase? So we've organized the therapeutic exercises, which I teach right after shoulder lab the next day because I try to link all those components. And we again have organized the therapeutic exercises by irritability because that's how the guidelines organizes this particular condition. So in the early phases, we do a lot of pendulums. Great, the students know that, but it totally makes sense now. And then in the moderate irrit irritability phase, pain and restriction are at mid to end range. We use a lot more cane and pulleys. And when they get to low irritability, you're doing your, a lot of your end range stretches. Imagine what is happening in the student's mind. This pattern, shoulder pain and mobility deficits, has been established in the lecture. I've walked through this like I'm doing with you to tell the story of how a in, unstable shoulder is different from a frozen shoulder, which is different from an impingement or subacromial pain syndrome so, shoulder. To be able to talk about those, to be able to have them see the techniques and understand the narrative behind the big picture completely changes how you teach lab. So in this app, for example, let me just finish taking you through it. There's a few different ways to navigate it. One is you can just choose a body region. Two, you can play by pain patterns. So oftentimes I'll say, guys, here's the patient complaining of sharp pinching pain at the tip of the shoulder. What are some hypotheses? Hypotheses. They will shout them out, right? In class, they would shout them out. In Zoom, they would chat it in. And then we'll look at some potential hypotheses. That pain location could be an AC joint sprain. It could be subacromial pain syndrome. It could be more things. And then there's also some red flags, some basic red flags here that you can talk about if you want to. These are just a general list of the upper quarter red flags. We're updating this with the clinical practice guideline that we're working on. We'll be presenting some of this at CSM. So if you go into the condition, subacromial pain syndrome, you can look at prevalence data. We recently did a lit review to, to try to look for the most recent um, uh, incidents and prevalence data. Here's the clinical findings that we watched together in class and they've watched on their own when they go through the worksheet. And here's the organization of the key findings. So for shoulder impingement, we expect to see an arc of pain. I expect the students to do a glenohumeral joint assessment, basic range of motion, accessory, and physiologic. This is the stuff we're gonna do in lab. So I say, hey, aren't you curious as a movement specialist how that joint is moving? And when you have a hypothesis, perhaps that this is an impingement problem, let's take a look at some of those tests. And so we've clustered those tests that they're going to learn. And then we put them together here this was based on some feedback from Lori, uh, Lori Michener at USC, where she said, hey, why don't you put in a um, test item cluster so that the students can, be, can know what kind of things go together and what the positive and negative likelihood ratios are. 
So we have all of these conversations as part of the scaffold. The other thing I would mention is that I use this regularly. We have ses sensitivity and specificity laid out at the bottom. So you can always reference it. Like we kind of know it, but it's always nice to have a graph to point to. So when we talk about sensitivity, specificity, and likelihood ratios, I always go down to this graph and I talk to them about it. This is what it means. This is why we use this test for ruling out. Um, and you can also see there's a nomogram here. So oftentimes, if I need to illustrate something, I'll say, hey, so your pretest probability is 70%. This test has a positive likelihood ratio of 10 or greater. And all of a sudden, when I draw a line through that, we're at 90 or 92%. Do you see how that changes the way you think about a condition being present or absent? So we, I leverage this all the time. That's part of the beauty of all of these different, this resource is that it allows you to expand and have visual transfer of knowledge without it just being verbal, where they're trying to hang on and visualize everything that you're saying. So in this app, for example, you can look at movement faults we've covered the most common evidence-based movement faults. So you've got three scapular faults. For example, insufficient scapular posterior tipping will include an assessment of posture, the scapular reposition test, and some potential impairments that you might want to associate to that post postural fault or movement fault. So the students learn early that movement is a big part of orthopedic management. It's just built in as though this were natural. So there's humeral faults, thoracic mobility faults. And then you can talk about differential diagnosis. What kind of things would you do to make sure that it's not a neck problem? Oh, cervical screen. Yeah, that's what we learned last semester. Or maybe you don't teach cervical in the same semester. It's in the spine segment. I use this still to place a bookmark in the student's brain. Guys, when we try to clear the spine, we oftentimes will overpress it in some type of aggressive position and PA the segments in a very, in a passive, the passive accessory assessment, because it allows us to get a sense of whether pain is referring or structures from the neck are driving the shoulder pain. So I have that conversation. Either it, I refer back to what they've learned or I'm, refer, or I'm putting a bookmark for what's coming next semester. Again, I think this is all part of the organizational process for a clinician. So there's, there's differential diagnosis. There is also associated impairments. Think about how complicated managing a shoulder problem is. Can we do justice? That's what we, we were trying to challenge ourselves. Can we separate what we think are key impairments and key examination findings separate from common contributors, regional interdependence? So here, thoracic mobility, upper quarter muscle length, scapulothoracic muscle strength, scapulothoracic mobility, you can talk about all of it and paint that picture in a visual map. It's very powerful. It's very powerful. It allows you to build a much more complexly wired student clinician so that when you are talking about all the techniques in lab, all of it makes sense. It is almost too late. By the time you get to lab, you've taught all the techniques and you're trying to have them reorganize it it's almost too late. It's a, it's a lot tougher. Believe me, I spent 10 years doing that, wondering why at the end of the semester, they were a jumbled mess of techniques. So I don't know if, if anybody feels that same way, but it's, it's not uncommon because ortho has so many dots that need to be connected that we naturally deliver in little silos. I make sure that I talk through all the silos before I teach them any of these techniques. So this particular app, will cover interventions. It will cover all the relevant outcome measures. And it will also, for example, if I take you to frozen shoulder, you will be able to see that in the interventions under modalities, I allude back to modalities all the time. I ask them, hey, so when they're in the really painful phase, the guidelines suggest that this might be, here's an A-level of evidence, the guidelines suggest that you might refer the patient back for corticosteroid. Or we have a bunch of other modalities that may be relevant. And so I asked them, hey, so if this patient was really stiff, they're in the thawing phase, 
what, what uh, dosage and setting for ultrasound would you use? I let them talk it through. And then I jump back into the physical agents app and we look at it together. Boom, here is purpose, here is setup. And here is the video as well as the parameters. And we just have a discussion. So it allows me to connect to new material and past material seamlessly. This is deep learning. So let me just finish off talking about the app real briefly. If I go back to the condition here. Like a real quick question, if I may interrupt. Sure. And I tried to get your attention earlier. Uh, back on the worksheet stuff. Yeah. How long do you kind of, or do you even give consideration for how long the students have to do pre-lab stuff? And are you concerned about it making a three unit class or really a four unit class, but not giving them credit and that kind of thing? Yeah. So I tell them on this lab, that it is their own guided walking tour. Their job is not to spend too much time because I'm gonna walk through this with them when we get to class, but I do want them to experience it. So I'm hoping that this is a 15, to maybe 15 to 30 minute experience. Um, you're right. I think there has to be some sensitivity to how much time people are spending doing different things. It's getting a little out of control, obviously. and. I think our team will have to reflect back on this year. In some ways, we're doing things to fill holes and to try to manage this COVID, another COVID year. Um, in reflection, um, we are going to have to think about how we're using the students' time. I, I haven't had a good, uh, uh, I haven't had a lot of pushback because the students have found that this process makes learning so much more efficient. They spend less time trying to figure everything out later. But you're right, There, definitely this is something that has to be considered. So this, this is low stakes, low points, and they don't, um, it's up to them how much time they wanna spend on it. The pre-watching of the lab techniques, I often see them doing it right before lab at lunch. So they're just sitting and eating lunch and watching techniques with their colleagues. So it's not a huge investment of time because they're just jumping through technique to technique. And some of them they've already seen before. Great question. So these lab, these worksheets, I download them from the Google Drive. I put them into my LMS. They know to download it, fill it out and turn it into me. My TAs check that people have turned it in and give them token points. Okay, let me show you how we, um, that's, that is essentially how all of these different body regions work. You can skip to all diagnoses, or you can sk skip to all the different techniques for that body region. This is a quick access panel. One other thing I want to show you that I think is extremely useful. At the bottom of any body region, so if I choose ankle and foot, you'll see this rehab progression pyramid. This rehab progression pyramid essentially allows me to help them create a hierarchy of of relevant impairments to assess and manage. So when you look at, I always say, guys, whenever we treat a patient, we always first decide is pain and inflammation present. If it is present, it needs to be managed. You cannot mobe an inflamed joint. You cannot strengthen an inflamed joint. So they're like, oh, okay, got it. When inflamed, I should manage that. Great. You guys, we should always look at posture and and see if we can put tissues in neutral to de-stress tissues when they're in recovery or put them in protective postures that reduce stress on the healing tissue. So think about posture. Eventually, I want to make sure that the patient has enough joint mobility and muscle length. Range of motion is a top priority before you start going after muscle function. So the students are like, oh, that makes sense. That's why in the early phases of post-op ACL or total knee, we're working on inflammation, restoring range, restoring strength, working on balance and gait, and then functional movement. I use this graph and this graph or this pyramid is built into every single one of our simulations to help students retrieve information. So we use this as a way to show them information about each area. 
And we also use it as a way for them to organize what impairments do I treat first? Very, very powerful. This essentially explains all post-op protocols. I use this all the time. So I want to show that to you. That again is, if you go to any body region, we put it as a quick access because we use it so often, the rehab pyramid. So like I mentioned for this app, if you look at head and neck and you look at the common diagnoses, neck pain with radiating pain, neck pain with movement coordination impairments, neck pain with headaches, they're linked to the pathophysiology, the path pathologic name, thoracic radiating pain, neck pain and mobility deficits, jaw pain with mobility deficits. We've generally tried our best to stay directly tied to the guidelines and to encourage the linking of the path pathology terminology that generally the world uses and to link it to these ICF categories that have well-established examination and treatment theories. They, they have well-established, you know, if it's stiff, mob it and stretch it, right? It's, it's really generally as simple as that. And then we add in a few other conditions. For example, whiplash, myself and Gwen Joel, we worked on this particular category. We read through the entire Michelle Sterling book and then made the whiplash category because in the guidelines, they tend to lump it together under movement coordination impairments, neck sprain and strain. But this is such a unique condition that we de it deserved its own full, like special category. Um, and yes, it is linked under movement coordination impairments because the general treatment strategy and examination strategy is the same as a sprain and strain. It's just, there's a lot more to consider. So I just want you to know that every single body region that you need, pretty much all the relevant special tests, we have carefully picked through and tried to only put really relevant special tests. Um, we have tried to integrate movement and the idea of movement faults and how they drive conditions, drive you know these different conditions. We've tried to link it all so that you can tell the story and help the students organize their mind. Let me show you just a glimpse into the lab component. So how, how am I doing lab? So when you go to, when I go back here for a second, here is lab from yesterday. And we'll get started in a second. Looks like Erica and Alyssa, you guys have a full gym in there. Nice. That's a team practice session. So when you're ready, you can go to biceps load two test. Notice for the bulk of the techniques in my lab, I have a link from PhysioU. I will teach you how to easily cut and paste links as well as pictures into all of your labs. I'm sure um, Alexis, you at Tufts, you guys have done something similar. I remember Josh writing to me and saying, dude, thanks for filming this. Now I don't have to fly in and film all of it. So um, I think that's, this creates insane amounts of flexibility. I could have put my camera on and tried to work on my son in the background, but many of these videos are better than what we can show. And another thing that dawned on me while we we're in lab, so let me just show you here. We reviewed the technique together. This is the, the third exposure. They looked at it in the worksheet. They looked at it at, on their lab handout already by themselves. And then we walk through, when we walk through the app together in class, three exposures to these techniques. And now we are going to do them together. So I click Remember on the link. Patient supine. Remember the patient supine. Patient supine. Passively abduct the shoulder to 120 degrees. Keep the elbow flexed 90 degrees and supinate the forearm. Passively externally rotate the shoulder to full end range. While in this position, have the patient contract the biceps by resisting elbow flexion. A positive test would be reproduction of symptoms at the shoulder. So the students, so then Passively, I can replay it as many times as I like. I can stop the video and talk about certain moments Think about how much better that is than trying to capture you 
There are some techniques for sure that I think we need to show. There are a lot of techniques that I think the video does can do a pretty good job at. So here's the other thing that was kind of useful. So let me go here. They asked me, hey, so how useful is this test? So we looked at the sensitivity, the specificity, the likelihood ratios. We ran it, we scrolled down and talked about the how the likelihood ratios change the likelihood of a disease being present or absent. And then we moved on. We moved on to a new technique. So there's so much that can go on when you have a stable resource that everything that you need is in one place. The other thing I would just say is this, when the students are practicing, if you just had a camera on, could you easily flip through different techniques that student says, hey, could you put that up on the screen again? I can do that easily. I just go back to my lab handout. Let's put on the R cert. Everybody's watching it while they're trying it. It's so flexible. And the students never worry that this is the first and last time they're going to see the technique. They know where to find it. They know, they've seen it before. They understand where it goes and with which category this goes with, right? We've organized this under shoulder, shoulder label tear tests. There's so much linking that's going on. And I promise you what happens is these tools that they're learning piecemeal are being placed in nice parts of their toolbox. They'll know when to find, where to find the hammer and when to use the hammer because the scaffolding has happened already. So that's how my lab handout is. My entire therapeutic exercise class, my entire ortho, every single lab has links. Now, how do you get to that? So let me show you. Let me show you how I get to that. Let me get out of this PowerPoint. When you go to any particular technique, so let me go back since we've been on shoulder pain and I choose a special test for rotator cuff tear and external rotation lag sign, you have a sidebar here that allows an educator to copy page title with link, drag it over to either your LMS, your syllabus, or your lab handout. You paste it. There's the title, and it's already hyperlinked. Then you go to copy thumbnail image. You drag it back over to your handout, paste it, and now you have the representative image. Your entire lab handout can have an image and a video linked. That's how quickly you can augment your lab handouts. Believe me, it is so, it's such a relief that if there's a technique that I can't quite remember or something that is a little bit more complex that I want to show on the big screen, my lab handout's full of videos. I can show the video on the screen, stop it at certain points, talk about different things, and then demonstrate it on the patient or on, on, on the subject. So that's how you leverage the PhysioU content. You know, if you go into PhysioU anywhere, so let me go back here, let me make this a little bit smaller, sorry. You can just say, I need, um, I need Thessaly. Thessaly test, copy and paste, and boom, your whole lab handout is taken care of. Now, if there are techniques that are missing that you need, please send it to us. We're going to the studio next week. We're filming a bunch of soft tissue mobilizations. We're filming a bunch of updated stuff. We're always filming and updating. So this resource continues to evolve and new content is built into it constantly. And that is why I think this can be a reliable resource. It's, it's future-proof in many ways. All right, so we are now, I, I wanna take a moment just to slow down here to take some questions, and then I wanna show you the simulations. Any comments or questions? Things that I could show you? Okay, feel free, James, stop me if you need to. This is what we worked on in all of 2021. Real quick, Mike, just want to yeah. point out in the chat, I put your email address so that way if you guys can communicate with Mike if you have any ideas for what to film. And, and again, it's uh, educators helping educators let us know what you think we need to do. And the other comment I made in the chat real quick was that the students can take this. I mean, we're Dr. Wong right now is really showing how the teacher 
benefits from this, but the student, they'll take this app with them onto the, into the clinical rotation and, oh, crap, I forgot that test. Boom. You know, Ed, Addison's test, I rotate toward or away. Boom. Yeah. They look it up real quick. So it's a great tool for the students. Yeah. Okay. So for, as you can see, we've added this whole new section. Everything we made in 2021, we spent building simulations to solve the next problem. The next problem I believe in, in education is students don't have a place to play with their knowledge in a low stakes way. It's either learn and then test and then hope you survive. I think that there's a lot of integration of knowledge synthesis that occurs by having them play through simulations and play through games. So let me just take you through the orthopedic simulations. The musculoskeletal rehab foundations is coming. We've we're in the process of vetting them. Every single clinical practice guideline in JSPT will have a mini game. So just, just take these four, for example, these were our first tester four. Um, I was trying to figure out how did we wanna do it? Were these gonna be formative or summative? These are fire and forget formative experiences that are fun, engaging ways for your students to be exposed to the guidelines. So if you take, for example, this patient, here is the game. It takes about 20 minutes. The student is not clear yet what condition this is. Okay, there's some clues. I want you to see that for these ones, we have very extensive educator information. Who is this patient? What condition is it? And what guidelines is it related to? Who are the authors of this guideline? A direct link to the HIP OA decision tree. Since we partnered with JOSPT for impl guideline implementation, we now link a lot of the JOSPT stuff here. And the purpose of this mini sim, the learning objectives, and you can now look at the entire sim, something that I think is very critical when we try to deploy sims in the classroom. The course key, is essentially every single slide of the game. So let me just make that bigger. With the answers, you can click through the entire thing in, five, in, in like two minutes, three minutes. You can see, oh, this is her complaint. This is the subjective exam overview. We've made these really simple. These are not complex cases. These are the beginnings of pattern recognition. Here is some uh, uh, subjective exam, ag factors, ease factors, and we ask the student to engage. Hey, take a minute from what you heard in the subjective, what kind of movement would you choose to reassess, assess and reassess to see how your patient is doing? And there's a little hint, and here's the hint. For the aggravating motion, you should choose what currently causes your patient's pain. It should be relevant to your patient's goals and daily activities. It should be feasible to assess and reassess in the clinic. So this is just an open-ended question for them to say, what did I just hear that might be useful for me to reassess? Then here is the pyramid again. And as they click on different elements of the pyramid, they will see, so that's one of the things that you don't see here is when they click on each level, they will see like, oh, there is limited mobility. Here's the range of motion of the hip. Oh, there's weakness of the glutes. Here's the range of motion of the glutes. I'll show you that in the real sim. And then we introduce them to some of the common special tests that are actually from the guidelines. So actually, this is a good point for me to take you into the sim officially just to show you. So what you can see is that they're really light. They're intentionally light because their goal is to make it fun enough and addictive enough to get the student to do the next one. I want learning to be fun. So there's patients telling their story. I think I need to do a squat because that's what the patient said is painful. So I'm gonna submit that. And here is the pyramid. How is their pain and inflammation? Five out of 10 worst, inflammation not visible. How is their joint integrity? Inferior and lateral acetabular femoral glides are hypomobile. How is the range of motion? Here is the range of motion deficits. It's not ideal. But if you try to think about how hard is it to deliver this type of information in a non-overwhelming way, just think about your paper cases. 
how do we organize this in a organized and predictable manner so that students can deal with little bits of information at a time? This is the way that we've decided to do it. And then they can watch some of these little tests. With the patient supine, flex, abduct, and externally rotate the involved side. Stabilize the ASIS on the contralateral side and press down through the femur. Okay, so they go through each of these tests and they move on and look at different self-report measures that the guideline talks about. So here are some common self-report measures. They can click on it and explore them. Then there is also physical performance measures that they can explore. Here is some basic objective test. This is what you found on your exam. After your subjective exam, take a look at the information you've gathered and let's talk about treatment. So here is a summary. So we take it from the pyramid and just give them a glimpse of the key elements that we want them to focus in on. And then we ask them, which of the, we try to link this, the, all the findings to the ICF category. So hip pain and mobility deficits. They watch a clinical reasoning video that describes why this is hip pain and mobility deficits from PhysioU. Here is a summary of those clinical findings that is also linked to the decision tree here. So this is essentially things that we've taken from the guidelines. And we ask, so based on the patient's irritability, which of the following movements do you want your patient to perform? I think I want them to squat because that was their asterisk sign. Great. So before you move into treatment, you're right. Here is something they said that was difficult. This is relevant to check in the clinic. It's meaningful to assess that. Great job. Now, based on what, based on the minimal achy pain in her hip, what would be the best treatment for the patient today? Grade one, two, body mechanics training, hip flexion mobilization with movement, hook lying strengthening for hip extension. So you can see that we've made these fairly distinct. These are not hard questions. Our hope is they're like, I think I need to improve mobility. So actually I'm gonna choose something wrong. Let's take a look at what happens. Incorrect, let's select another. Oh, actually in this particular set, we force them to go through, they can review the entire thing later. It says, by the way, whenever you treat, please consider the rehab pyramid when choosing your treatment. Since your patient's pain and inflammation and posture are under control, you can proceed to treating joint mobility and they can look at the pyramid and double check. Then we show them a video from PhysioU of the technique. Remember, they haven't learned any of this. I'm using this at the beginning of hip week that they will have these games to play through. Now you could totally use this also at the end of hip week so they can organize themselves. You can decide how you wanna use it. I'm, I'm always experimenting with preloading their brain and using formative tools to create less chaos towards the end. So I, I'm not convinced yet exactly which way I've been using these at the beginning of, of, of the week. It's something they play with because we have bigger sims, more complicated sims that are more summative for them to play with later. Those are the ones I use at the end of the week. So here they did the MWM. And a glide is applied in a caudal or lateral caudal direction. And, may and then we reassess the patient and she's able to do better. Your manual treatment was effective. What exercise would you like your patient to complete at home? I think I wanna do something that improves hip flexion. So I'm gonna do some, let's see, single knee to chest. Great, good job. Hip flexion mobs help to reduce your patient's pain, improve her squat range. So you want to continue working on something that improves hip flexion. Think about what that just did. It creates the concept that I am trying to match my therapeutic exercise to the intervention that's managing the key impairment that is linked to her functional limitation. Just like that, asynchronously, these things are happening in your students.
So here's the exercise. The patient can improve hip mobility on their own by bringing their knee to their chest, making sure that their pelvis stays in a neutral position. So they get to see the exercise. I mean, who knows when they're going to learn this, depending on your curriculum. But I don't think you should wait to connect the dots. So at the end, there's a little bit of patient education. Just remember, every single one of our sims is built the exact same way. They're completely predictable because it creates a sense of reliability and safety for the students as they navigate this. It's such an important concept. So what's going on? This is what we tell the patient. How long will it take? This is ten, tends to be what we tell the patient. What are we going to do in PT? This is what we say. We're going to do treatment to improve the flexibility of your hip. What can you do to help yourself? If your hip is very painful, take some weight off the leg using crutches or a cane. Slowly keep the leg moving on an hour by hour basis. So you can see we are also framing in the student's mind. These are the typical things we tend to tell patients. These are the things that they want to know. Here is the treatment uh, rehab pyramid, just for you to remember. As you create your plan of care, you consider the treatments to implement in future sessions. Based on the rehab pyramid, what select the best order of the following treatments? I want to continue with range of motion. I want to eventually do some type of motor coordination training, strengthening, and I then want to change the way the person moves. Great job. Here is a review of a SOAP note, subjective, objective, assessment, and plan. And here are the results that your students can now turn in. The students can always go back and review the entire SIM and see the things that they missed. So they cancel and they hit review. They can always retry. Why do I let them do that? Because, so here's the review. You can just click through and see all the things you chose and what you got right and wrong. As you can see here at the bottom now, there is a learning history. Every student will turn this in to me. So they download the learning report and you will be able to see the last five attempts, how long they took to go through and when they did it, who did it, what SIM did they do, what score did they get and how long they took. They turn that into me because I give them token points to play and learn, all asynchronous. Think about what that means. Probably by the end of March, all conditions from the clinical practice guidelines will be here, every single one of them, exactly the same format. You can allow the students to play through it with reckless abandon, because there's nothing more than the clinical practice guideline built into these games. The last thing I would just mention is that there are some much more complicated games. We are building them as we speak. They take a lot longer to play, but there's a lot more decision-making. Let me just give you a quick example. If you look at the course key, and I would invite you just to explore this on your own. It covers, let me make this bigger. I apologize, it's a little bit small here. It covers the case, outcome measures. It exposes the students to outcome measures, asks them to interpret outcome measures. Is this high, low, or moderate irritability? It covers, it asks students to determine based on the aggravating factors, how irritable is this patient? And there's a hint that helps to describe what irritability means so that they can make the right answer. And there's feedback when incorrect as well. This goes all the way from examination to treatment to therapeutic exercises. And then let me, let me come out of this and just show you one other key thing that I think is really cool. If we scroll all the way to the end, right? You can see the explanations are much more extensive for why an answer is right or wrong. And we take the patient. Great, you did a great job. The patient's doing better. One week later, there's a follow-up. Here's a basic chart review. 
And it is now time for you to determine. So you ask a few follow-up subjective questions. So I'm training the students to ask certain types of questions. And their job here is to interpret, did the outcome measure improve or not? What should we do to progress or regress? So here, what should I do now? Which of the following treatments would be most appropriate? How do you progress or regress a treatment based on the patient, patient's response? At the very end of these games, there's the references as well as a summary. The summary describes the story, describes the key impairments, describes why the key interventions were chosen. That is how each of these sims are built. And you have, right now you have three upper quarter and three lower quarter. These ones, four upper quarter. These ones are much more extensive. You've got one for low back, one for hip, one for knee, one for ankle. You can just let them play through it. Use it as a way to discuss. So um, I apologize for this going so long, but I'm, uh, that's essentially what I wanted to share about the different sims. So are there any comments or questions, Natalie or Tamara? Yes. 